Uh, today, I want to speak about translation. When I say translation, what comes to your mind about translation? Please, shout out. Language to language, translation unit. Right. So translation can mean different kinds of things. What I will be focusing on is um, translation in terms of scripts and this, uh, how you express yourself in the GUI, and also on what's going on in the compiler. Because the compiler is called translator. If you look at the standard, you will find uh, very deep in the standard one time that the compiler is called a translator. So compiling C++ is also a kind of translation thing. This is the outline, it's not too much interesting. But the interesting part is in the bottom low corner, you see a number. Whenever you see a number and you have a question, please write it down so that you can return back to this particular slide. And if you see a picture like that, this is the time I might possibly take a question but I think we don't have time for that. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about me. I'm pretty busy. I'm an electrical engineer by profession. I'm a physicist by heart, and I'm a software developer by accident. I've done a lot of things in the past, yeah, 45 years or so since the end of the 70s. And uh, yeah, I'm employed by a small company in the north, of Bavaria, Nuremberg, and so this is why I'm here today. And now I have to switch my position because I can't see anything. What I want to talk about is this particular machine. And you see a time arrow, and it starts at the year 2009. In 2009, the current company that I'm working for was founded. It has a long story behind that, but the very first machine that he built is this machine, uh, not this uh, nice machine, a uh, prototype machine. And we did everything only in German because we were a young company, just shy of 10 people. And so we had something that needs to be done. This machine is to inspect wheel sets on trains. And this is from a rail depot shop. It's not a really nice place to be. And what you see here is a wheel axle, a solid wheel axle with a simple geometry. You can immediately uh, imagine you can inspect it from the outside. When I said inspect, please don't make it uh, kaput. Uh, it should work afterwards. This is, this is the point. So we don't speak about these simple wheel sets. Instead, we speak about this kind of machines. Everybody knows it. These are passenger trains. And in the bottom, you find the wheel sets with the wheel axle. And as you see in the bottom of the screen, it has a complicated geometry. And in the center of the axis, there's a bore. And the bore is there for inspection purposes because you can then put these kind of instruments, push it into the bore, and on the um, on the outside of this, um, we call it proofkopf system. Please bear with me. Um, <laughs> it has about ten ultrasonic heads. It has a coupling using oil. It has a motor in there, and this is what is pushed into the bore. Um, the smallest diameter is 30 millimeters. So we have to make everything pretty compact. And this was what we have been developing in 2009. We were two software engineers for two different PCs. I was one of them. And as you can imagine, the company was young, so it was uh, pretty much like a startup culture. Features, features, more features. Customers were asking for features. 
and we need to get a name because it doesn't make sense to implement something and get broke two years later or so, something like that. So the important thing is we had to get the, in, the architecture right. This is the most important thing if you start a new company. You don't have to implement everything from the scratch, but you need to imagine what does it take to implement something. So one of the key features in there, how do we format our strings? And how we do we um, put out anything from the core of our machine? Because we not only had the, the business logic, but we also had a GUI. And I'm not talking about the GUI. I'm only talking about the business logic and everything in here is using boost format, probably known by many of you. It's similar to the C printf library, but it's also a C++ library, so it's different in some way. It has advanced formatting specifiers and uh, you can support user-defined types. In the bottom, you see how the interface would look like. The important part here is it, the, um, the string contains the full uh, representation, so you can imagine what the string would look like in the GUI of your machine. This is different from the IO streams, where everything is a single piece. We don't use them because it's difficult to handle. So this was the beginning in 2009. Five years later, we were still alive, but something has happened. The unimaginable, unimaginable. A customer was coming to us who is not speaking German. That's bad. So we had to translate the whole application. Yeah. And nobody of us sp uh, spoke Czech. So yeah, that's the point. So here, it's the first time that string translation comes into play. A couple of questions. Which translation system to use? Is the translation system mature? Does it have editors, tools, and a build system? Okay, the build system is not a problem. We have our own build system, so we can expand it. Does it fit? This is an important question. We can't uh, change everything in our business core logic just to fit a translation system. But the most important question is, can our end users handle it? We can translate to German. That's no problem but we can't translate to Czech. So the end user had to translate everything. So um, the question is, can a end user actually handle the translation system? So what kind of format to use? Binary format? Yeah, not a big problem for us, our customers, uh, absolutely not. What about XML? Cool, machine readable, we understand it, software understands it. But our customers have no clue what XML is. And the same is true for JSON. So what our customer understands is text. So text should be the translation format. And here comes an open source library into play, GetText. I'm not sure if anybody of you is aware of GetText. It's pretty much everywhere. You find it with every language you can imagine there's a c implementation that's coming from gnu and there's also a c plus plus implementation coming from boost and this is boost local um, the translation system revolves around c locales and message catalogs so it's not too difficult to understand and if you're following the standardization process um, there's even even a reason proposal for runtime formatting that actually mentions GNU get text. So I think we chose right with this kind of thing. What kind of tools does get text apply to us? My, uh, the first step, we need to mark up our source code for translation. How do you do that? You start with boost format, with the formatting specifier and change it over and say something like translate this particular kind of string. And this is all what the, 
need to do in our application. With the help of the, of the uh, boost local messaging, we can get translation at runtime. Step two, use a tool to actually scan all the marked up strings in our sources so that we can get out of our sources what actually needs to be translated. This is a difficult kind of uh, command line. Our build system will handle it quite nicely. And what is the output of the scanning process? Something like a PO template file. It's this kind of format. You don't need to understand everything here. This is language agnostic and it's transient, so we don't have to bother with it too much. Step three, translate this damn thing using more tools, message unique, message merge, message attrib, and now we are getting country, region, and uh, company specifics to actually translate the original strings into what the customer would like to see from our The result is a so-called portable object file, a PO file. And this is actually stable and you can put it into your revision control system of your liking. The good thing is you can have multiple of them. For example, every different subsystem can have a PO file on its own. You don't have to, but it's supported. And the output, the content of this PO file looks like this. Now you see we have an entry here. What kind of language are we actually translating into? In this particular case, it's Czech. And in line 14, you will see that there's a, a formula. How many plurals Czech actually has? In this case, it's three. And what the rule to figure out which plural form to use should be used in the translation. So in this case, we have three different plural forms. So we get three different translations here, singular, dual, and plural. This is something that our customers actually can understand and we can give these PO files to them and so they can translate it. Step four, now we come into play again. We get all of the translated PO files, merge them, and now comes the final step, message format. And this message format kind of thing is actually checking the translated strings for validity. The translated strings also have the string formatting information in there and it needs to be valid. And message format understands a couple of different um, formatting languages, like boost format or others, and it can actually check them for um, well formedness. And this is really important so that we can get uh, valid translations from our customers. The output of the message format is a so-called MO file. This is a message speci uh, machine specific output format. It's a binary format. You don't check it into your revision control system. It's actually described in manual and it looks like this. I don't expect you to understand it too much uh, without studying the actual specification. The important thing is we have uh, a table, we have the original strings in there, we have the translated strings in there, and everything is aligned typically to four byte integers so that the um, input into the machine or the software is pretty easy. What we're actually interested in is only the translated files. Everything else is just information that you need to look for. When I speak about Unicode, everybody of you knows what Unicode is. I'm pretty sure. 
and everybody understands Unicode covers glyphs, code points, and encodings. And this is actually not true. There's more to it. There's also Unicode CLDR, the Common Language Data Repository. If you look at the website, you will find it in the bottom. And what does it speak about? It defines machine readable rules for translation, for example, but also units. So Unicode is much more than just glyphs and encodings. And here you see plural rules. And if you look at the, and the relevant website of uh, Unicode, you find languages are different, not actually new, and complicated. And you should follow the rules. The native speakers don't like unimaginable translations. And they get a long list of all the different languages and scripts. And you have a short form, and this short form um, encoded, and there are norms for it ISO 639, ISO 3166, and POSIX all have opinions how the languages should be called, what kind of types of um, numbers we deal with, what categories we have, what the rules are. Everything is described in here and it's actually machine readable. And there is also at the bottom of the, of the website, a nice picture where all the languages are listed and to the right, you find all the cardinals starting with zero and going up to some number, how much screen space it takes here, you can imagine. And to the bottom, all the different language form families. And you see in, in the top, there are simple language families like Japanese, or Chinese or Vietnamese, which don't even have plurals. And you go downward and you see the rules become more and more difficult. You have more and more plural forms. And in the very bottom, you find the Breton language from not too far away from here, which has the most complicated of them all. And uh, yeah, you need something to describe that. And you see here a couple of these plural forms that the GetText understands. It's a single C line expression. I've actually shown four languages here, Japanese, German, Czech, and Breton, of course. And you see there's a quite huge variety with all these uh, languages in here and the plural forms, how you specify the patterns in there. Let's switch gears, come back to Boost Local. Um, among other things, Boost Local understands the message or implements the message facet of the local. And everything revolves around a basic class type called basic message. This is one of these godlike classes we all know and love. It collects can you understand me? Okay. It's no longer talking to us. We need a translator. <laughs> Hello. That's okay. Can you understand me? Okay, we're back again. We found a translator. Okay, I was speaking about godlike classes, and this is here the, the basic message class where you collect all the information about a translation. 
the singular form, the plural form, the context, context is for disambiguation, and also the cardinal that actually determines which language form, which plural you want to use here. This is just to collect all the information. It's a lot of um, constructors, conversions, write operations, everything you can imagine under the sun. And it has a couple of free functions to construct this class. One of the functions is an overload set of translate. This is what we use, but you can also use the C type functions. Okay, you don't have overloads in C. Uh, C++ 23 may we get uh, overloads, I'm not sure. But this is how traditional C looks like. So boost local also brings additional overloads and help us for boost format. And this is the one of the um, things that I had in the beginning, these in the translation system has to place nicely with the existing formatting system we had in our machine. So boost format and boost local play well together. There is one thing that I really don't like about boost local. It does way too much. For every return operation, it not only does translation, but it also does an encoding conversion. Your source code can be in any encoding. Nowadays we use Unicode, but back then uh, we had code pages. DPO files could use any encoding. The output uh, translation could use any encoding. And this means you need string allocations here. So you're actually littering your heap with string allocations. And this is something I really don't like. So let's move on. It's the year 2018 and there's a new library on the block. I've been an avid contributor to the format library starting 2016, 17, something around that. And I knew pretty much about format and I actually wanted to use it here in the machine. So instead of using boost format, I was using just FMT format. It doesn't look too unfamiliar. So instead of using boost format, uh, creating a, a, a central class, the basic format class, and an operator to actually pass in the arguments, you do it in one call in the formatting library. Most people don't know that format has two interfaces. There's interface number one. It looks like this. This is what you see in the, um, in the um, for example, the standard uh, or in, 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 in blog posts or something like that. You pass in a string view for the string formatter specification. You pass in a couple of args and you pass the types that come with the arcs. The arcs are a format, formatting argument pack and the types are a type list type argument pack. And there's actually a second interface in here that has a V in front of the names and you see there's no longer a template here. And the second interface is actually, or the first interface is actually implemented in terms of the second one, using something like the make format arc functions that turn all the different types of arguments that you can pass in into something that is type erased. If you want to know more about type erasure, here's the perfect person here. Klaus Egelberger has a book on it and it has a training on it. So speak with him if you want to know more about type erasure. So the first interface is actually a type full interface. You pass in the types of all the arguments. The second interface is a type erased interface. Our string format is just a string view and the format arcs are, have no longer templates anymore. So the type full interface is here a thin wrapper around the type erased interface. 
and this is how it looks like. The actual work is done in V format and not in the in the um, template with all the argument types in here. So we see here two kinds of type erasure, but it's not really type erasure. It's more like a type classification. Types is an infinite set of um, things that you can pass in. We are actually pulling it down to something like um, a handful or something like that. So when it comes to type erasure, let's look back to boost format again. And this was quite to my surprise in the preparation of this talk. I was looking at the basic format class and what do I see here? Type erasure. Type erasure in formatting is not actually new. It's an old kind of thing. So, which one do we like more? I want to know a little bit more about your opinion. Let's imagine boost format doesn't use the, um, the percent operator to pass in arguments, but the comma operator, and now compare boost format with the FMT library. Which one do you like more? Okay, boost format, show of hands. Oh, I see nobody liking the boost format version. Um, why? Okay. And the second one, who likes the second one more? Okay. You chose wisely. And so did we. So when it comes to type erasure, how do you do that? FMT is actually using every technique under the sun that you can imagine to do type-based metaprogramming. It uses templates. You need templates to do type calculations. It does do partial template specializations because partial template specializations help you in pattern matching. Overlap resolution and implicit conversion sequences. So you actually learn something about conversion-based metaprogramming. And all of this together leads to Sfine. Sfine, short term for substitution failure is not an error. It's actually a way to control overload sets because every feature that you're using here, every type that you're passing in here, every type that you want to format needs a different route through all the inuits of the formatting library to actually implement it. So if you want to learn anything about type-based uh, metaprogramming, study the formatting library. In the beginning, in 2000, let's say 15 or 16 or so, I wanted to know nothing about metaprogramming. Templates are evil. Don't use that. In 2000, 2018, I knew everything about this kind of stuff and actually liked it. So, but always never forget the cost of type-based operations. There's the so-called rule of heel. And... Um, you have some operations which are really expensive. For example, Sfine is dark red. And looking up a type, a template that you actually have memorized is dirt cheap. Compilers love it. And you have a scale in between them. And actually in 2017 or so, um, Heel Dowers was an intern at a company located in Bochum, an auto intern founded by Odin Holmes. And now it should probably ring a little bit. Odin Holmes knows a lot about type metaprogramming. So this is the reason why we have this rule of heel here. And to go a little bit deeper, we have to figure about 
of thinking about what actually is a function. Back at school, we learned functions. Y equals f of x. So it's actually mapping from x to y. It looks like this. We have, on the left, we have a set x with all the elements in there. On the right side, we have a y, a set y with elements in there. And we have a mapping in between them, something, for example, like that. We need a description how we do this mapping from x to y. Actually, x and y can be anything not just what we learned at school where we had rational or irrational numbers, it can actually really be anything. And this is something that you really need to understand. Okay, let's look at f. Is this a function? Sure. This one? Sure. This one here? Okay. This one, uh, solid principle, People might a little get a little bit nervous. What about this one here? Also a function. You notice notation here? F takes anything. Also a function. And about the return types? Is this a function? I hear yes, I say no, because the amount of return values is unspecified here, so we can't really tell anything about the mapping. What about this one here? Yeah, of course. This one, useless, but of course. This one here, no. We don't say anything about the return type. And this one here, now we, yeah, sure, of course. This one here, just as well. You understood it. So we can have any number of arguments, but we have need to have a definite number of return values. This one is a function, of course. This one here. Sure. This one looks a bit, little bit strange. I hear laughter. OK. This one here. Since since C plus plus twenty or so, we have a lot of freedom with our names. Yeah, this is a function. And this one here. Lambdas, of course, this is a function. They have to be unique. That's the only point here. This one is a function. Okay, it maps an X to a Y. This one, is this a function? Yeah, sure, it maps an X to a Y. The spelling is strange. A little bit jittery about the parentheses. This one here, you take rulers, to no longer be jittery here. It's also a function, it's a mapping from X to Y. This one here, Okay, yeah, right. What do you know? Actually, write a proposal. We can do that in C++ in the future, maybe. It maps X to Y. This one here. Just another kind of brackets, phrases, whatever you name. It maps an X to a Y. All just the same. This one here. Yeah, of course it's a function. It takes two arguments and maps it to a y. One takes angle brackets, the other next takes parentheses. But at the fundamental level, it's a function. The meaning of the brackets or braces or parentheses that we're using here have a meaning in a context. That's the only thing. Besides that, it's just a mapping. So we have three functions here parenthesized arguments are usually a runtime parameter, but it can be potentially valid 
also at compile time. Whereas the arguments in the angle brackets is a manifestly compile time parameter. You must know the value at compile time. There is no discussion about that. So the context is valid, which parameters are valid. Okay, we have two functions here and we know this x can be pretty much anything in C++. There is hardly any restriction here. There are actually rules in the standards what you can place into the angle brackets and it's expanding over time. And the same is true for the y. There are hardly any restrictions here. So this is actually way more versatile than the typical functions. So functions can return any number of any kinds of things. This is a function, it takes a t and maps it to a bool value. This is a function that takes two types and maps it to a Boolean value. This is also a function that takes a t and maps it to a similar, some more kind related type t prime. And this is also a function, it takes two types and maps it to a third type. This is a fancy function it takes a function as a parameter and a type pack and returns a type. This is a new function from C17. It takes a type pack and returns exactly one type called void. It's highly useful. There are actually talks about only this particular type function here. So type traits are your friends. Look into the standard, look into CPP reference or whatever you prefer and learn about type traits. You have lots and lots and lots of type functions in there. And what about this one here? It maps two types to a third type. That's all it does. And we have multiple ways to actually implement such kind of functions. Here is one that returns a Boolean value. It maps a type to a Boolean value. Or this one here. It maps a type to a Boolean value. And this one here. It's actually called value. It maps a type to a Boolean value. So in C++, we not only have one way to express ourselves. As usual, we have way too many ways and we need to learn about them. Sometimes it's version R that fits better, but sometimes it's version B or version C or whatever it is. And please, please never forget the rule of heal. Please, really, I mean it. Agreed? Okay. There's one more thing. There's Boost MP11. There's Quasia. There's Brigand, Metal. And please forget about Boost MPL. But if you do something complicated with type, type functions, algorithms, all this kind of stuff, use libraries. You don't have to do it by yourself. The most easy stuff is already in the, in the standard, but more complicated stuff comes from libraries. At least you can see how you know all of them. Okay, let's move on in the timeline. Year 2021, yeah. No longer FMT, but uh, the formatting library made it into the standard. 
So we have std format right now. I'm still using both local for local uh, for runtime translations, and then also a little bit later in the year 2021, C plus plus 20 adopts proposal P 20 to 16. Okay, at least one person knows what it means. Okay. Does, does anybody know about P2216? Okay, good crowd. Um, let's move from C20 to C20. In 2022 in Prague, I've been there when we shipped actually C20, and the signature of the formatting function was like that. The current version, same function, has a different signature, but not too different. You see a, a slight difference in the argument types, or actually how you pass them in. And you see that the string view of the formatting string is replaced by a separate class, the format string. And the format string takes also the types of the arguments. And the most important new thing that's coming in here is the format string is a const eval compiled function. The constructor is const eval. Const eval, familiar? It means can only be constructed at compile time. It takes in the string view as before but it needs to be constructed at compile time, which also means that the arguments to this constructor need to be known at compile time. And this is the meaning of constable. In 2020, we said, okay, the string view takes arguments which are potentially evaluated and constructed at compile time. And in most cases, we actually did. But in 2021, P2216 says, no, it necessarily has to be constructed and evaluated at compile time. This is how the constructor looks like in a current implementation. This is from the MSSTL. There are a couple of things going on here. It's not too important to understand what it is, but it actually has the opportunity now to check the format string syntax or the, the specifiers in there. And it can also check all the types of the arguments that you supply because we pass in the types of the arguments as a type pack. So we no longer have any exceptions at runtime. And this leads us to the question, what actually is constant evaluation? We know during compilation, the compiler has to remember everything it sees, identifiers, entities, declarations, definitions, more templates, template instantiations, pretty much everything. Actually, this is the reason why you have modules now. No talk without modules from me. But what about these kind of declarations? What do you think about that? We have a couple of declarations here that actually need constants the size of an array, the enumerators in an enumeration, the body of a static assert, and also the argument of size of operator. All these need to be constant expressions. So all these values need to be known at compile time. Without these, the compiler has no clue about what's going on here. So in 
a graphical representation, we see our compiler has actually kind of a split brain. On the left side, we have all the type kind of things, all the declarations, names, instantiations, and actually in many compilers, um, all the type traits and, and what you can imagine doing with uh, any types are implemented as intrinsics. So the compiler is asking itself, what do you know about yourself? And this is what I call the entity table. This is the stuff that's called into a BMI of a module. On the right side, we have another kind of thing that's implemented in compilers. And this is the constant evaluator. This is where all the value stuff comes in. Actually, the constant evaluator is ages old. C has it, Lisp has it. It's probably even older than that. I can imagine at least the 50s or something like that. And we had it in C++ since the very beginning, but we barely used it that much. With C++ 11, we have an expansion of the compiled constant evaluator. For example, we got const expert and const expert says, treat the right side of this declaration of this const expert variable as a constant expression. So the compiler has to evaluate the initializer of this variable and it uses the constant evaluator to do so. And this is expanding with every new C++ version and um, currently we have a proposal of reflection where actually the constant evaluator is passing information back to the type system. This is what's kind, uh, what's called um, slicing um, code injection, this kind of things. So these two different worlds, the type world and the value world can interact with each other. This is the new kind of thing that you need to know about the upcoming C++ 26 version. So constant expressions. We have a constant expression every time we need a constant. So this means every time we need a constant, we do a new constant evaluation. And this also means you start a new constant evaluation whenever it needs to take place. It looks like we got a new translator. Okay, thank you. Um, and this takes place even if you are already in a constant evaluation. And this is what trips most people over. You have a function, you have a variable in variable in there, and this is called const expert. And you say, oh, everything is nice. We are already in a constant evaluation. But actually, no, we start a new constant evaluation. So all the arguments, everything what's going on here in the constant expression needs to be evaluated there. And the lifetime of all the arguments starts there. So please be aware that constant evaluation is way more difficult than you might imagine. I don't go into details here. So what now? Let's move on to the year 2022 and 23. Until now, I had C++, uh, Visual Studio 2019 in production which was using and implementing format from 2020, where you can pass in runtime format translations. But now this is a side effect of P2020-16. We need compile time translation. This is the fallout of this proposal. You no longer can translate at compile time anymore. Why? Yeah, the translation is a runtime thing. You can't do it at compile time. 
So boost local has died. No longer possible. At least the front end is no longer possible. I can still use the back end of boost local where all the management of the translations take place, but I can no longer use the the front end where I mark all my translation strings and, and compile and, and compile them together. This is no longer possible. So if we look at the format string, it's now const eval, and uh, there's also a function called const expert here. Okay, I'm back again. Um, I have a new format function. It takes the same kind of arguments, but it no longer takes a, a format string as a formatting argument, but it needs a format string argument, um, translator as an argument. So this means if we have any arguments, I need to figure out quantity I want a translation for. I need a respective translation at compile time to actually format this kind of stuff. And I need to figure out which kind of translation I need for my argument. So here's the quantity. Here's the translation of the formatting string. And this is how I translate my arguments if needed. So the new class that I use here is the former string translator. This is one level deeper. This is an empty class with a const eval constructor. It passes the arguments down one level. And here is the meat of it. In the format, trans, uh, format string, we learned the format syntax and the format argument types are checked in here. I use the format string translator, a uh, format string here for the singular form, for the plural form, and also I check if everything matches together. I don't have to implement this myself. The standard library does it for me. And it does nothing. It returns no value. It's just something that is done at compile time. If I go one level deeper, my basic translator also takes all the arguments, is also constructed at compile time. And what I do, I take the um, something like a digest out of it. This is a representation of the strings and pass the existence of a plural form from compile time to runtime. This is something that I can do. I can pass information from compile time to runtime. Because I need this information at runtime. Do I have a plural or not? And once again, one step deeper, I have a base translate class takes two overloads and one of the overloads is asking the backend for some information about how to translate kind of things. And it calls the function calls lookup and the cardinal that I pass in and the digest that represents the strings. And this is the only runtime code I'm using here. Everything else was done at compile time. It leaves us with three questions. Number one, which of my argument actually holds the value, the cardinal that determines how to translate the formatting string at runtime? Number two, how can I access its value? And number three, how do I figure out, do I need to translate a particular argument. 
Okay, this is the solution. It looks a bit weird. Please don't try to understand it. Please don't try to actually try it because we are in year 2024 and this is C++ 26 with the reflection proposal and also with pack indexing. Hmm. So we need to come up with something like that. This is, we can't have nice things. We have to implement it all ourselves. So how do we get the plural index in a homogeneous sequence? We use how to do that. We have the ranges library, we have algorithms galore. We have predicates, we can do anything. But um, Thank you. <laughs> you will be my helper from now on. Um, there's a paper by Graham Hutton and he talks about functional programming. And there is a nice title of it. I thank Andreas very much about pointing me to it. It's about the universality and the expressiveness of fold expressions. Some examples, if we have a homogeneous sequence, for example, a vector of values, these are a couple of algorithms you can use, sequences, predicates, um, projections, and what the outcome is, we all know about that. And in heterogeneous case, we have a type pack of types, a type list, and this is how it looks like. In the, homo, in the heterogeneous case. Excellent, right? Yeah, don't be too happy about it. This was just the easy sequences and the easiest algorithms. We need something a little bit more complicated. We need a ranges if for heterogeneous type lists. How do we do that? Okay, we start with the simple case. We have no result, it should look like that. This is our predicate. In this case, I say, I want to look for arguments that have wrapped into a plural type. Okay, this is my predicate. For reasons, I have to make them a class. Uh, we are not so expressive yet with C++. And now I can pass in my format string translator and it uses an algorithm. I call it find first index, which is just a find if. Takes a predicate on my type list. Yeah, you can use easy algorithms as well. Uh, you've seen it this sequence at uh, the, the, the slide before, and I can actually check if everything matches up. So This is the beginning of an actual algorithm on heterogeneous types. A simple function called find first index, it returns no index. Unit test passed. Change a little bit. Nothing has changed. It's an unsigned type. Everything is fine. Let's pass in my type list. And my predicate, remember the predicate takes a type and returns a Boolean value. So my predicate is a type template as well. And you see a couple of unit tests here. Um, one is okay and two of them um, are not yet okay. Now we can do something with the predicate and the type lists, we can use a fold expression, which means we start from left to right, apply the predicate to every type, and stop when the predicate is matched. Okay. Yeah, this is what I said before, we need a type here. Let's massage it a little bit more. 
it's just a tautology, nothing has changed. The ternary operator changes nothing here. So we actually fold over the ternary operator here. Now let's little, get a little bit more fancy. Let's number our types. From left to right, starting with one. And now the comma operator here within the parentheses says, okay, increment the index with every type. Do it before you actually evaluate the predicate and stop as soon as the predicate is matched. Now we are almost there. As soon as we match, we return the current index, the number of the argument into the result value. And now we have of all the types. I think this is a pretty universal principle how to actually implement an algorithm using predicates and types with fold expressions. You use ternary operators, you use the comma operator, in this case, actually two times. And this is just four lines of code or five. I highly like it. Even though it looks like you're pushing a stubborn donkey across the street. But please try to remember these kind of tools that you can use from C. It's actually C what you're using here, except for the fold expression. So number two, how do we get a, the argument? It was the second question. We have a couple of um, arguments with different types. So what? This is the signature here. We know the index because this was I was just showing here. And now, what do we know of, about our arguments? Each of them is a reference. It's either a L value reference or it's an R value reference. What do we know about references? References are no objects. References are just alternate names for existing objects, which means we can take the address of it, of the original object. We can type erase it and pass it in as the actual initializing values of an array. And we know the index from compile time. This was just the value that we've evaluated at compile time in the slides before. Now we can index into the array, reapply the type because we know exactly what it is. It was the, um, the predicate in our function, it's the plural. We can dereference it, and now we have pack indexing of heterogeneous arguments. Nice. And this is actually valid code. There is no undefined behavior in here. And last but not least, we have type-based selection. OK, one template a partial specialization and a total specialization. We can return a type alias. We can return a function for each of these specialization. And this is what type-based selection actually means in real, um, in real world. And that's, that's it. So this year, Visual Studio 2022, update 10. I drop boost local because I have everything in, I need. I've implemented a library, um, partially at least, it's not complete. 
how many progressive and I have an integration test. We all know integration testing, unit testing, all kind of testing. And I actually embed the MO file of the Breton language here. This is also a proposal. I'm not sure if it's no, any longer proposed by Jean Heat. It's in C, but not in C++, yeah. But I have, I have it here. And I can actually pass in the MO file, the binary of the translation, all of the stuff that I've been showing in the earlier slides, everything that's done by the, by the build system, and it's loaded in here. And I have a little bit about how you can play with all these different kinds of things. Now you've learned everything about type functions. You have learned everything about constable functions. It's a little bit, it's a small play. The interesting static assert we learned, it needs a constant value. So we need something that we can't pass in to actually evaluate the body of the static assert here. And we also have a little bit of runtime code. It's actually nothing. Um, the left side of the expression in the static assert is a lambda. I hope you can see it. Then you have an equality operator because we immediately evaluated the lambda, got a value out of it and compare it here to a string literal. This is known at compile time. And the lambda does a capture and the capture we create a translator from the integration domain, yeah, just because why not? And we load the MO file from the const eval function and the constant expression here in line one. We pass in the cardinal in this test and the meat of it here is the lookup function that takes the information about the default language that I'm using. This is the front end. I mark up my strings that I want to translate but I pass in only the 64-bit digest. And this is what the integration test is supposed to do. I hope everybody can see the code here. Is it large enough? Okay. You see, this is the same code as before. I'm using modules. I hope you don't mind. Um, and here is the static assert. And it's actually compilable. In this particular case, it took me two, a little bit more, about two seconds. Even for everything here is done at compile time. The static assert is one constant evaluation. And we look, if we look back here, you see the load function in the uh, in the capture takes in the um, the binary of the translated MO file, and what it does is it checks the header, checks the tables, looks for the meta strings, checks for valid UTF-8, checks the plural where the plural rules are, it locates every string in there, the singular, the optional context, it calculates the 64-bit digest, 
determines if every translation is actually unique. It looks at the translation forms, at the language forms of all translations, checks them also for validity, builds a string table out of them, builds a lookup table that we can pass in the digest and find the actual translation. It finds the entry points in here, it creates a second table, this time UTF-16 instead of UTF-8. It checks the syntax of the plural rules, passes it into terminals and tokens, checks for grammar, builds a syntax tree, optimizes the RST, compiles it into bytecode, kind of a VLV um, machine that I'm building here, optimizes the code again, and in the end, we end up with a, di a mapping from the digest to the first string index. This is something like open hashing here. We have pretty good ways how to do that. It um, maps the string indices to strings, and it actually creates, creates a program for a virtual machine. And this is everything what is done with C++, 20 language rules, vector, string, span, and a couple of views. So in the front end, I have these translate things, you know, it actually um, compiles the string representation, the context, the separator, and the, and the singular into a digest, the 64-bit digest. This is done using a hash function, which has very good uh, properties to actually find out all of the, or actually it mixes the bits very good. And it's actually usable at compile time. And it um, initializes the base translate digest in here. And it also passes in all the other strings because we need them for uh, syntax rule checking. We've seen it in the slides before. And the lookup is nothing else but take the digest, map it into an index, take the program, pass it in the cardinal, pass it into the virtual machine, and get a plural index, the language form out of it. We are the actually translated string. The Breton language, yeah. You see it as a couple of terminals operations. My bytecodes have a lot of instructions in each of them. And it takes up to 21 bytecodes, up to 20. This is the, the longest one. Actually, every other language just fits into one cache line. So in total, we have because I'm using all the translations from the machine that I've seen in the beginning. It has 500 translations from the core logic, a couple of raw language forms, has a table, a lookup table of 24, uh, 1,024 entries, a couple, which means you can pass eight of them into one cache line. And actually the whole Static assert evaluates into something between 2 million and 3 million execution steps. And most of these execution steps are done at the right side in the constant evaluator. So this is the end of my talk. See you see a couple of resources. The library code is not finished yet. This is how you can reach me. I will probably announce it on Mastodon. The QR code will lead you there. And with that, are there any questions? Any questions? Is that a hand? Thank <laughs> you.
Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like where to start. Uh, so so this is is, is uh, of course uh, intellectually very satisfying to uh, to solve these problems uh, at such depth. Um, I am just amazed. Uh, is 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 your your railway wheel testing company paying you for that or is that a hobby of yours uh, the company is not paying me for that but actually this code is at least partially yet in production the compile time stuff is in production the full library is not yet i will put it into production this year and when i'm done with that i'm happy with the api i will open up the sources so that everybody can look at it and use it in their applications. Yeah, but when it's a, sorry, it's a personal question, not a technical question, but yeah. um, is, is that part of your daytime job or is that a hobby? No, 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 this is not part of my daytime job. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then thank you in the name of the community of, for, for doing that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Actually, this is uh, the work of the last half year. Yeah. Um, so I understood that in, in the standard library, well, in the C++ standard, uh, the C++ standard describes the behavior of a uh, standard library component, not the actual implementation. That's right. But with this amount, of, and, and if I understand correctly, for other parts of the standard library, there exist different implementations. Right. Uh, Microsoft does it that way, mm -hmm. and, and the Linux community Let's does it. Uh, but with this amount of complexity, will there ever be a second implementation of the format library, or do, do you publish it under a license so that Microsoft then can use it as well, or will it take uh, 15 years for them to, to follow up? Actually, there are multiple implementations of the formatting library there. With all this? Uh, not this, but uh, the, the um, argument type checking and all this kind of stuff is actually implemented in every standard library these days. Yeah, and, so and that's, that's this new stuff that is coming then with C++26. Uh, uh, that will also be, will be implemented by different... It will different, be uh, everyone. In every implementation. Yeah, yes, they will take the same code or they will re-implement it on it their own? It will be re-implemented. Okay. Actually, you can play with the C++20 yeah. kind of stuff right now on Compiler Explorer. There is an experimental version of EDT who has implemented, for example, reflection. So I could check this with my library if it actually works, but I'm too lazy. Amazing, thank you. All right, any other questions? Um, Klaus, sure. So we, we had a couple of people online and there was more comment than a question. So uh, Andre noted that he believes that the nested context for context are about to be get merged into C26. And he's actually also posted a uh, paper number, P3032. And he thinks that the, it's not yet a proof, but it's apparently staged for wording. So perhaps this is an addition. Uh, uh, yeah, that's probably true, but I'm yeah. a little bit uh, behind reading all the proposals. So, so I think this is the why last it's 100 or so are still missing. <laughs> no, but it, this might be interesting. But so uh, actually, thank you very much, Andre. Yep. He's also a member of the committee. Right, any more questions in the room? Doesn't look like it. Oh yeah, one more here. To be honest, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I got lost a little bit. It was okay. very advanced. So I'm not sure about my question. There was one slide where you presented um, the fur when you shipped it the first time and compared it to the to the version where you introduced the const evil expression. Mm -hmm. And I I recognize that the const on the arcs got removed from the first version to the const yeah. evil. What is the reason for that? The reason for that is um, we want to get rid of all the specifiers in our arguments. 
Okay. So we got rot, got rid of out, um, all the R value and R value references there. We got rid of const, volatile, and this kind of stuff. So from the unlimited number of types, we have reduced it by a factor of eight. So we still have only an unlimited number of types there. Okay. Yeah, this is the first step of type erasure. Okay. And we can use type functions to actually reduce the amount of the operations we need to do. Once again, if you want to know more about type erasure, I'll okay. close. And uh, another very basic question. Yeah. I don't know the definition of plurals, but if I saw it right, uh, you said the, ger or the, the German language has two plurals. Yeah, many West European languages have that. So is singular one of the plurals, or is it it's two uh, types of plurals? It's TLDR calls them a plural. I call it a language form. Every translation has one, two, or up to six language forms. Okay. And the CLDR calls them plurals. OK. Which actually means in the in most Asian languages you don't have plurals at all. So the the concept of a plural is something completely foreign to them. So we're a little bit blessed to actually know what a plural means. So, but in uh, so in, in in Germany the first plural is actually the singular. And the second plural is the actual plural. Yeah. Right? That's how it's called. That's so how it's called. We have two language forms, the singular and the plural. Yeah. Czech has three. Slovenian has four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what uh, what is the LDR is. <laughs> yes, Slav languages have, have uh, in many cases three. Sometimes for Arab has six. Arab. Arabic, yeah. Right. You, you have another question? Okay, one more from online. Okay, so Andres asking, uh, what is the utility embed that you used in your presentation? Is this available in MSVC? It's not. This is the implementation of mine. It's actually extremely simple if anybody wants to see it it's just three lines of code okay so uh, i think andrew wouldn't mind he wouldn't mind <laughs> okay all right so we're all getting an encore now this is it the full module, one function that's exported, it's the embed function. It takes a string array, a string literal, and returns a span. That's it. Good. Okay, then uh, I think that's all the questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I think this was a, a, a very interesting whirlwind tour through. Uh, all the different metaprogramming techniques that we have available in the language today, like we keep adding them uh, at a pretty breakneck pace these days. But um, I think this this gave a nice overview. And like, if you understood if like some of this might have been a little overwhelming for some of you, but um, if you maybe go through the slides uh, again uh, on a, a cozy Saturday afternoon and uh, think through some of these uh, things again, I think you will find some some really interesting coding techniques there. So uh, yeah, let's give another hand to Daniela. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and Actually, yeah. it's the string literal that I take in here as a constant value. It's a different representation of the MO file.